Hi guys and welcome back to another episode of the Aerospace Innovation Show by Astro Capsule. Today, I, your host Prasad Doke, would be having a mind-blowing conversation with the co-founder of Space for All and Magneto Space, Mr. Terry Trevino. Talking about Terry, I don't think there is any branch of space which this person must have not explored. If we go through his expertise, it would be astrobiology, astrophysics, cosmic anthropology, exoplanet hunting, supernovas, and whatnot. So let's not waste the time and skip directly to the conversation with Mr. Terry. Hi, Terry, and welcome to the Aerospace and Aviation Show, first of all. And to start with the interview, my first question to you would be uh, introduce us to cosmic anthropology in simplest possible terms. Yeah, I uh, and thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to visit. The, um, the term is really from Dr. Graham Lau, who is with the Blue Marble Institute. And and he and I were were chatting one day about you know how best can we understand what anthropology might be outside of the Van Allen belts, and 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 honestly, it to us it seems as if it's the um, it's the amalgam bringing everything together that's outside of the Van Allen belts that is a part of our anthropology. And in my case, uh, <laughs> he and I even like the word co cosmobiologist because at the at at the end of the day, it's uh, it's all chemistry in the vacuum of space, and uh, at its simplest form, that's that's what I think and believe um, anthropology is outside of the uh, uh, of the atmosphere of Earth and beyond. Uh, clearly, uh, you know, anthropology connotes the um, you know the existence of other life that might be available or might be around us, and um, you know yet to be determined. So that's uh, and uh, that's a chapter that we haven't gotten to yet. But uh, moving forward, that's a question which I had personally. Uh, the thing is something which I am not able to understand from a long time. What is the difference between cosmos and universe? Yeah. Um, if you go back to the you know, to the days when um, you literally have to go back to the eighteen hundreds and when we started to look out and beyond using our our primitive telescopes. C cosmology and cosmos are synonymous, in my opinion. Uh, it, it's really a science, and the universe is is everything beyond that understanding of that science, which we <laughs> we are only just beginning. You know, it, it's funny you think about it, Prasa. Uh, we're only a hundred years into our. Um, our epiphany of understanding what's going on beyond uh, maybe a little more, maybe it's 107 years, thanks to uh, uh, Dr. Einstein and his work. But I, uh, I do believe that, uh, that they're synonymous. However, cos cosmos is maybe more of a, it's like microeconomics. It's the smaller version of the universe, which is a much bigger uh, thing that we don't understand, uh, that we're working you know, every day to hopefully understand who we are, what we are, how we got here. Uh, the universe is uh, a, it's a big unanswered question mark, my opinion. Uh, that's a lot better. Moving on, uh, you have yeah. been working on interstellar clouds. Enlighten us with that. We, I, I want to understand uh, the, I, I call it the ISM. I, I want to understand the ISM and how uh, chemistry works in the interstellar medium. 
there's so many perturbations that that occur uh, in a in a gas cloud that starts to condense and I, I don't I don't believe that it's just gravity I, I believe that there are other forces that that we have yet to determine how they interact with the the molecules that are there it's it appears to me that it, the, the four fundamental forces um, strong and weak radiation gravity uh, the uh, the electromagnetic spectrum and um, and then the quanta or the quantum you know this all things small in, in my in, in my estimation there are a lot of boxes that need to be checked before we we can understand how a gas cloud condenses I, I and then once it does condense the ism it's it's almost it's almost like it's a a river right and when you're in a river you see the little eddies that form as the river passes through perturbations and these perturbations a stick that's sticking up out of the water and it causes those little eddies and 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 i think um you know to me electromagnetism is is a big part of what what's happening in terms of creating those perturbations but then again dark matter which we clearly can't see because it's dark uh, but we know it's there you know that that might also have some some to me it seems it seems that there is something else going on and i and i can't i can't wrap my head around how dark matter which is a completely unknown force is working together with all the other fundamental forces. And, um, that's, that's where I, I think we, we've got a lot to learn. And, and I, in fact, I was just, just reading an article, uh, or a study, excuse me, on, on ISM and dark matter. And, and, and that percentage might be much higher than that that standard number of 70%, you hear approximately 70% dark matter. I think it might be higher in those ISM in the interstellar medium. And we'll, we'll see. I, I, I hope one day we can detect it in some way. You know, it's funny, the detectors that we have now, they're only working in <clears throat> our, what is, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> our Planck constant is uh, 10 to the negative 35. Well, we're only able to resolve, candidly, we're only able to resolve 10 to the negative 20. And so <laughs> that's a very large scale that we're, we're, we don't understand. Uh, and so I'm, I'm curious if and, and when we get there, uh, how things are going to work. It's, it's funny. I, I, hear, I have the article up right here, the Dark Matter article. And, uh, and the study that was referenced is brilliant. It's, uh, it leaves me, you know, spinning. I'm trying to understand it. Uh, before moving forward, I would like to say that you have some great books kept in on your back. Yeah, yeah, these are my favorites. Um, so I'm in I'm in my lab, um, and and my and my laboratory has these are basically reference books. And then, uh, and of course, you can kind of see some workstations that we have. <clears throat> my, um, it's Sunday morning here. Uh, my one employee uh, is off, but I do have uh, an intern who works for me now remotely. He's back in university and has just, uh, he just left Friday, which, um, you know, it's always good to see them move on and move into um, to their, uh, to their studies again. But uh, yeah, uh, there's so many really good books here. You know, the first book that I really cut my teeth on in in, uh, in understanding all things small. Uh, when I say that, I mean um, uh, co the quantum rail realm uh, was uh, un until the end of time, which is a Brian Greene book, and it That's took it took months. <laughs> it took Dr. Green's book took months to read. But it was uh, because I had to read it and then reread. And he he is uh, he is one of our um, our brilliant minds of of our time. 
one of, there are so many now. Uh, you know, the beauty of the technology we have here is to be uh, to be able to have this chat with you and, and be able to share this knowledge much more freely. You know, I, that's why I think we're making these these leaps into understanding and these these almost the you know the reach is so much it's so much further I, I really feel as we're as if we're on the cusp of understanding more than just what the large hadron co uh, collider that it can provide us I think we're collectively we're gonna we're gonna find, get a lot of answers I think in a very in the very near term I, I, people you hear constantly 2035 I, I think it's faster than that um, one of the other books was um, was oh I don't have it here. It's Freeman Dyson's book, and I and I, I don't I don't have it. Oh yeah, I do. Oh. It's a brilliant book, Disturbing the Universe. It's I have never heard of the book. I'll definitely yeah. go through it. Please, it's a it's a collection of of many of his writings. And uh, and it's uh, it's it's quite large. Uh, it's well, it's not that bad. It's uh, three hundred pages with references. But um, Freeman Dyson uh, completely never received his doctoral. Yeah, he never he was not a, a PhD. Um, similarly, I'm um, you know I, I I feel like I'm also a, an uneducated um, and only self-educated. Although I have gone to numerous schools, it's uh, it's interesting to uh, to read his thoughts. He's uh, he was a, a great thinker, and only died when nineteen or in twenty nineteen, two thousand nineteen. He passed away. It's uh, he lived a long time, a good life. And according to me, you know, PhD doesn't matter a lot until and unless you have a good knowledge. Yeah. Anyways, so, moving forward, uh, you have worked on protoplanets and protoplanetary disk also. So how did you get into this and also explain us what it is? Yeah, uh, also a book. Uh, here, and here it is. Uh, it's the Astrophysics of, it's by um, Philip Armitage, The Astrophysics of a Planetary Form. Brilliant book, isn't it? it, it uh, and I have it, I have it on, um, uh, Audible and which was terrible on Audible, it's awful. But uh, it's also I also have it on my uh, Kindle. It's a brilliant book. Uh, so that's I, I really I read that three years ago, and then I started um, understanding a lot more about how the protoplanetary disk works. Um, you know, there's that that big question that uh, Armitage brought up, which was how does something that's uh, a one one meter one meter in, in in size how does that start to accrete and why wouldn't it be the opposite as things hit, hit it that it, they just bounce off and um so that was that's kind of the big unanswered question right for uh, the protoplanetary disk and how it forms i think we're really close to understanding that and i that that again might might feed into understanding more about electromagnetism in my opinion and um it, it's funny that's one of the fundamental forces that that doesn't it doesn't doesn't have the it, it's almost as if um people just thought well ele electromagnetism is just the transfer of light and energy and there's i think there's more to it than just that um I don't know. It, it it was probably answered in 1864 or whenever that was that um, that those first uh, articles were coming out by um, uh, what was that Englishman who wrote all about it? I can't even remember his name. There's so many great, brilliant names in the past, and I can never remember them. Whereas Dr. Green can re remember every name and every date, and uh, I've, I've seen him speak a lot, and I know I think you have as well. Um, anyway, but yeah, that's. Uh, Interstellar medium, protoplanetary disks, they kind of go hand in hand, right? The, you know, a, a gas cloud condenses, it starts to spin up, you you get accretion, and, and then how do things begin to 
spin out and what is it in that material at that at that spot you know in in the goldilocks zone where it starts to kind of accrete all of the right things so that we are here and you can see a flower you know <laughs> when i see a flower i always wonder how did a flower come from protoplanetary disk so i i i kind of those are kind of those fundamental questions that we're all hoping to answer very soon but yeah, the um, protoplanetary, they're, they're fascinating, aren't they? I'm, and have you seen the one with the moon forming? Uh, that was one of the, um, um, I think it was Atacama that came out with that re recently in May, I think. And it showed the moon forming around the planet as it was forming in the protoplanetary disk. You're like, wow. Anyway. But yeah, that's um, kind of where I think I'm, I'm at with that. Okay, that was a good journey to start with. Exoplanet yeah. exploration has remained a topic of interest for a long time now. So what do you think? How far have we reached and what can we expect in future? Well, um, and it, w one of the other questions I think that you and I were, were thinking of covering here in a bit, uh, with, with the great unknown for our exoplanets themselves are uh what are on those planets you know what what chemical composition do they have and and then of course i think you saw the post on uh the release on thursday the finding the finding of co2 or wednesday uh finding carbon dioxide is is a big that's a big move in the right direction uh, because you and i both understand that you know that is one of the key elements um molecules that really help us decide how life forms and exoplanets outside of a few hundred light years i'm very interested to know more about but you know then <clears throat> then you see james webb coming up with wasp 94b and saying hey wasp 94b is looking very interesting and then they released the co2 data but you saw the data they released on 94b in the first release in the first dump and it had silicone, it had uh, all the other chemicals that we really need, the base, basic chemicals for what we consider to be um, the, the, what we would need to form life with. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm really interested to see as we progress with James Webb and, um, and kind of feeding into one of the other questions I know you, you were gonna ask is, how, how do we use Webb, how do we use Gaia Gaia data, the DR3 the data uh, is mind blowing um, because now uh, at a very great distance, right? We can actually see the um, uh, the planets spinning around and rotating around the, uh, the these host stars. Hopefully, tying all of that together, <clears throat> that to me would be the next big move: is tying the James Webb data with the Gaia data with maybe pa past Kepler and TESS data. TESS is, is amazing. Um, my, uh, my most recent thesis, one of them, was on TESS and one planet, excuse me, one planet and perhaps a planet uh, rotating around a star, TYC 34132422-1. And, you know, there's something there, right? And it's not just the binary star that I believe that it is. There's something else in it, but it's 1800 light year away. <laughs> yeah, it's too far. Uh, so we, we started narrowing our focus to less than 100 light year. And now I'm, I'm, I'm only researching less than 100 light year, preferably even less than 100 light year, 30, 40 light year away. Uh, for a couple of reasons, right? We, we won't be able to gather and, and, and pay for James Webb time unless, well, we don't have to pay for it if we can justify it. but. Um, we won't be able to get their attention, right? Unless we can say, hey, look what this is, look what we found. And, and so I'm hoping to use the Gaia data, use the James <clears throat> James Webb data as a kind of a foundation and uh, and then using test TOIs, test objects of interest are, are kind of what we're looking at now. And uh, I've been doing that uh, literally almost every other day. Uh, we've got a lot working in here. But um, that's one that just always is, is moving forward. We're always looking for uh, um, exoplanets with clouds. 
would be really nice. Uh, I could go on. Make, you just made me skip one question, which I paid. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Uh, uh, let's go get on and uh, get on to space for all. How was it started, and why was it started? Space for all was hopefully the beginning of us, you know, people like you and I, working together um literally for this kind of this fundamental goal of understanding how everything pulls together what there is some key thread you, you hear uh often the unif the grand unification I, I we might be quite close to that in fact i read an article this morning about how you know, the unification may be as simple as uh, a mathematical equation we've overlooked we'll see I um uh, I, I hope so, but Space for All is a is a, a think tank. One of my advisors, I have two advisors. Um, one's a, a wealthy. Um, um, he founded all these great chem drug companies and therapy companies, and and uh, he's a big philanthropist, and he's a big he's a massive believer in what we're doing here. But the team itself is quite small now. But we're we're all thinking through these big problems, and I, I want to say a think tank, but one of my advisors likes the word act tank, and uh, meaning we're going to act on what we find and what we think about, and we're going to continue to answer those big questions, uh, and that's and that's what I'm working on, practically every day is what I'm I'm working on. And when you go to our website, you can kind of see all of the things we're we're working through. There's quite a few there. I think there's six major projects that we're on. Okay, uh, we'll get into the project some other day. Right. If, uh, before that, we'll skip to your new venture, Magneto Space. Tell us about it. Oh, yeah. That that kind of uh, <laughs> that moves into hopefully understanding electromagnetism, right? <clears throat> um, because we can create those fields. And we can uh, manipulate those EM fields, these EM waves. I started. I started with um, uh, Coleman Lutz. Cole and I, and Cole is a uh, uh, undergrad student moving into a master's program, and he is just, you know, similarly, right, a, a brilliant mind. Um, to those of you who I'm meeting every day, and we're all, we all know that there is some fundamental truth to. Um, things and uh, I, I i i have always felt like the electromagnetic spectrum is a little more undefined uh, it's not just light i think it's the perturbations that it creates so the, the this device that with the light on there's there's two there's two things going on in the very back on the wall there's a control and then here in in, in the device itself is a um that is an electromagnetic wave generator, and it's a pulsed wave generator, and it's it's pulsing at about 50 hertz, it, it, exactly 50 hertz, and it's pulsing a wave that, that propagates away from the device about 60 centimeter, and it creates a field. Um, I, I don't want to call it a force field, but it does create a field, and that field is um, it deflects high energy particles. Wow, you know, we all knew that. And Dr. Bamford, uh, who really came up with the concept, she's a particle physicist out of the University of Leeds, I believe, in the UK. I always get that wrong. Could be Lester. The uh, you know, we, I found, um, I didn't find that she had developed something like this theoretically until after I had already manufactured the device. And so I, I worked on that for about six months. And then in February this year, I fired it up and it's working around the clock. And uh, right now I have uh, uh, Arabidopsis in there. I'm trying to grow Arabidopsis staliana uh, with the thought that it, it won't be, um, it won't be killed. <laughs> you know, I'd like for it to do well. On the inside, it creates a, it's, and you can kind of see, maybe you can, and probably not, but on the inside, it's about the size of an Australian rules football or, um, you know, a rugby ball, a field. 
that's protected. And so we're, we're, the goal is to get to Berkeley or, or Lawrence Livermore Labs and try to fire um, um, high energy alpha particles at it and see how it does and, and what percentage of those alpha particles it deflects. The goal is to um, use magneto space as kind of the, um, is the, the, we have to pay for all of this, right? So I had to form an entity. So I did that with coal. And the entity really just covers the costs of, of paying for all of the development of the device. The device itself <clears throat> cost about $20,000 to make plus time. You always think about time. Time is free. I don't, you don't pay me anything. And, um, and so that it, it's working. Uh, I've grown lots of different plants in it and they're doing, they do quite well in this near null magnetic field. We want to call it a near null magnetic field because we're bringing it down to at Earth's magnetic field or just a little less to see how they do. And then we want to take that device and we want to put that on the surface of the moon. Uh, I have been offered a ride with Blue Origin when they go up uh, and uh, the, I forget the name of their consortium that they have. It's, um, there's several of them. Um, and hopefully we get that opportunity to take that device, put it up on the, either on the surface of the moon or maybe put it um, in in their uh, um, in their lander and uh, and test from there. That the goal would be to to protect plants and bring them up, and it can be scaled up, right? We can we can make it larger, and we can maybe even wrap that around uh, a habitat, a human rated habitat, or a plant module, and that's uh, that's the goal of that work that we're focusing on. I'm speaking about it in uh, Paris at IEC. I'll, I'll bring, I'm not, I can't bring the device because I'm pretty sure I'd get thrown in jail if I tried to move through um, air, airport security <laughs> with that device. But um, it, because it has this ominous look to it, but it's quite, it's quite harmless. In fact, uh, it, it, the field in here is, uh, it's almost zero, uh, about 60 centimeters away from it. But when you get up next to it, it's not terrible for you. It's just that it's, yeah, I wouldn't recommend you live in that electromagnetic field. You want to be on the inside, not on the outside. Anyway, that's what magnetospace is. And so we're, we're working on EM wave theory. That's all. How we can use it in all these different places, hopefully to save our lives. <laughs> you never know. Hey, uh all the best with that and moving on yes, you know you. march now has been uh, has been in attention for a long period now and venus is coming up really yeah. good so what would you tell about venus exploration we had a really good meeting this week with um um well it was actually it was a couple of weeks ago it was the um um the analytics group the nasa analytics group the pag um, so the PAG for Venus, they're really keen on, on developing technology that will allow for us to be, um, at about 70,000, well, about, uh, 25,000 meter. And once we get up at that, to that elevation, you know, we're, um, we're quite safe from the Venus surface. And so we're you know, the Venus PAG, PAG, are working through that at NASA. And that was a really interesting meeting. By the way, that meeting is open to uh, any and all. And, and if you ever get on um, one of their you know, mail lists, stay with it. It's um, LPI, the Lunar Planetary Institute. And they, um, they have their PAG meetings are open to uh, all, everyone. And we can ask questions as well. <laughs> it's fascinating. PAG. The Venus PAG, uh, and then we had a, uh, there was a new group that just founded. Um, he's a very famous um, PhD, and he's also, he was at NASA for 20 some odd years, and I forget his name. He, and I can get that to you, but um, he actually might be from India as well. Um, brilliant mind. He's got, he's come up with some methodologies to get us up at elevation and, and allow us to hover there, you know, without, um, uh, without, um, you know, crashing into the surface of Venus and then boiling away to nothing. But, um, yeah, 
we'll see. Um, it's it's definitely balloons, which I love. I think that's a brilliant idea. We shall see where it gets and where it goes. But the, the Mars, um, Mars University are working with them. And I'm a, I'm a, a teacher at Mars University. So I'm hoping that, uh, that we get to work through and with them as well. I'm fascinated by Venus. Uh, being as close to it as it is as well, I think that's also a little more interesting. And it's inside too. It's uh, it's kind of, you know, we're on the cusp of the Goldilocks zone, right? Which is why we're at risk here all the time through um, K, you know, um, any of the uh, KOIs that might be flying at us <clears throat> or uh, uh, what do they call them? The copper, uh, KBOs, sorry, the KBOs that will be flying at us at any time, unknown you know, coming out of the light of the moon or excuse me, the sun. And all of a sudden we have three days to re react. That's not going to, that's not going to go well. Um, so we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm interested um, in what Venus provides. If we can make that work, we'll see. That's a big ask. That's a big engineering. That becomes much more of an engineering task, right? You, you, you were, where I'm happy to work through that, but I, I feel like, <clears throat> I feel like that we could land on the surface of Mars and maybe a bit, a bit safer but again mars is further away from the sun and also the same problem you can see the surface of mars is littered with you know meteor and asteroid strikes of some kind so yeah i'm interested um let's see where they get i we're partnering with them i i think we'll we'll know more in the next um in the next few weeks uh what do you think about uh, cities in the clouds of Venus, could it be a potential future for space colonies? I do, Prasad, but it's, um, I think the engineering uh, side of that is, is going to be quite the challenge. You know, we're, we're going to need power up there and uh, we have to get above the, Venus, the Venusian clouds. If we can get above the Venusian clouds, then we know we'll have, you know, brilliant sunlight all the time there's a, a company out of australia that is manufacturing a really ultra thin i think it's one um one millimeter in in in, in um, thickness solar cell technology that would be really light as well and i think if we can get we can get through that and then yeah yeah i could see us all you know not all of us but i could see a lot of us um you know as in the scientific community being there and, and doing research and working through you know the problems that venus presents i it, it's kind of like mars right i don't i don't i love the 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 thinking through the engineering side of that is going to be an absolute challenge you know how do we stay at that elevation what gases are there that we can use to allow us to stay at that elevation and and you know how do we move through the winds? The winds are incredibly high. Uh, they're, in fact, you, you know, it's not unusual. We think that you you place yourselves in one of those jet streams and you can go around the, the entire planet in a couple of hours. And that's, uh, that's a, you know, that's going to be a lot of stress on something that might be floating. So I, I yeah, I'd, I'd like to think so. I'd, you know, I, I do like to be a big thinker, but I also throw the engineering hat on and go, I don't know. <laughs> okay, we'll see. Uh, it's going to cost a lot of money. I wish we didn't have all the wars that we had and we'd have a lot more money. Uh, anyway, that's me just making a political statement. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, how excited are you about Artemis is going to launch tomorrow? Oh, well, well, uh, first coverage starts tonight at midnight, uh, my time, um, East Coast time. Yeah, I'm, it, you know, Artemis 1 is, it's unfortunate that it's just a test bed because I, I feel like we're, we're ready now. Um, I know that they, they don't want everybody to die in some big fiery plume crash. <laughs> So, uh, you know, we, I hope it goes very well. It's unfortunate that the cost is so astronomically high. Uh, but then you look at, you know, you look at the, uh, um, you know, what, what's been provided for in, in terms of 
the number of jobs, 70,000 jobs is a, is a big number. And that's, uh, you know, that's kind of where the, um, I, I like to think that, that those are people who are also like you and I, aerospace scientists, right? And are working through understanding how the lunar surface can be a benefit to us in some way. And I'm, I do believe that the expense is worth it. I, I think if you look at, as an example, uh, the James Webb, it's uh, overall cost, the, the J, JWST was 10 billion American dollar. 10 billion is a lot of money, but you, you look at the almost trillion dollar budget that we have every year, or 800 billion, whatever the number is for our army, you know, maybe we could spend some of those dollars instead and, you know, really kind of expand, expand our minds a bit more. I know we have to, unfortunately, in this, in this world that we're in, we have to protect ourselves from aggressors, you know, rogue state aggressors. But, um, you know, 10 billion is a drop in the bucket and look what it's provided us in terms of data and information about who we are and what we are. Why do we need to find that out? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think Artemis is, is a, is a part of that whole equation. Our, the Artemis program is much more inclusive, which I am very happy to see. I, I think that's where we kind of missed the boat. I mean, how many Einsteins are there in uh, Mumbai? Let's think about that, right? And how many Einsteins are there in uh, where, where Russia? Now, I'm sure there's several that are being manipulated in some way. But, you know, you look at it and, and all the other famous names that are there in the past, right? Einstein, Rutherford, you know, you think about all of them and there are millions of us, literally, that would be out there and be willing to do all this. Ukraine, you know, another great example. How many are, are, are the great thinkers are there? So let's let's open our minds. Let's get out. Let's just reach. Let's stretch. Artemis is going to do that, that whole, whole program. The ESA, um, uh, European Space Agency, are a big part of that. And uh, hopefully uh, ISRO as well. I think, um, you know, sounds to me like you're going to be, right? And I really hope so. Uh, your your technologists and your engineers are brilliant, and so let's let's open it up to all space world, and uh, let's get uh, let's get to the surface of the moon as fast as we can. I I I think I feel like we wasted. So I was alive and was watching when Neil Armstrong stepped onto the surface of the moon. I was five years old. And I remember to this day my father weeping because of the, you know, the enormity of it at the time. <laughs> you know, we've always looked up and looked at the moon. Wow, that's beautiful. And, uh, you know, here we are, right? We're going back. You see that hashtag a lot lately. We're going back. Anyway, uh, Artemis is going to be spectacular. Oh, yeah, we're definitely excited here. More than uh, most of us. Some of us are like, why? <laughs> why spend that money? But here we are. Okay. Uh, what would you point out if you, uh, if I ask you a major difference between Apollo and Artemis mission? Well, um, not a big difference, really. We're, you know, we're we're going to the same spots, or we we are going to go to the South Pole versus going to kind of the mid plane. Um, you know, they've picked the landing zones for um, Artemis three, I believe. And so that's exciting. So, you know, Artemis 1 is uh, robotic. Artemis uh, 2 is manned, uh, excuse me, human-rated, human, human rated, uh, rotating around and coming back. And 3 is land. And I, I, I think I'm excited. Uh, Apollo was a very large stretch, right, from the mid 19 60s through the early 70s where right? we you, you you can go back into and see how much we we progressed as a humanity and i think this is just one of those other stretches right where we're continuing on in that vein right what 
great robots are brilliant let's send all the robots we can all around the universe uh, but you know as it is we've got a uh, viking that's you know finally i think on its last um on its last few amps and uh and it's almost done but yeah let's let's get uh Let's get back. Let's. Uh, there, there. To me, the only difference is the 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 SRBs, <laughs> you know, solid rocket boosters, and uh, you know, uh, it's the same problem, right? We we need to be we need reusability. So I, I wish that Artemis one was a reusable. Um, that's unfortunate that it's not. I think the Orion capsule they believe will be reusable, but I'm I'm not too sure that. Um, I think they've built. They have a budget to build 10 of them uh, but they've only built two so we'll see i'm i'm concerned about the mission in in many respects uh, i don't want anything to happen negative right it has to be this has to go off perfect which is why it's cost the billions that it has and uh yeah otherwise we're, we're going to the same spot we're gonna go check out the moon see what's going on i feel like uh you know it's uh you're right there so i'm i'm been to the uh, Chomoloma and I've been to the uh, Everest region and um, uh, you know it's uh, it's like going to a big mountain right and maybe it's K2 versus Everest but um, you know I, I really think that it's stretching reaching that's the big difference is that we're continuing on that and that's and that and now look everyone's included like everybody on the planet and it used to not be that, right? It was just us in Russia, and Russia, and now the Chinese are doing amazing things, uh, really amazing things. Uh, it, it, you know, Isaro is also, I, I like to say Isaro, it's Isaro are doing amazing things. So let's see, I, I, you know, this is clearly, it's translating to uh, every other part on the planet. Even, the, even uh, uh, was it At Africa has their own space agency now. Let's go. Let's all go. Yeah, that's the difference. Uh, you yep. being a lunar enthusiast uh, will highlight how the moon will serve as a rehearsal for actual Mars and deep space colonization. Well, it's the perfect test bed for living in controlled environments, uh, human rated and uh, plant rated modules. You know, I, I, I'd rather not we go and live in lava tubes. Uh, I'd like for I'd like for humanity to live on the surface of these um, of these planets. I, I know the moon, not necessarily a planet. However, it's quite large. So, you know, it was just unfortunate that uh, it stuck with us, thankfully, actually. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's a stepping stone into other places in the universe. If we can harness some of the energy that we know that's there, uh, harvest our own uh, rocket fuel. I'm curious about helium-3 a lot, uh, being bombarded as it has been by you know solar storms for four point however many billions of years. It's probably got quite a bit of helium-3 locked into the uh, lunar regolith. So I'd really like to, I really like to use that. That's, uh, you know, that's a brilliant spot. I, I, are we going to be able to run a foundry on the surface of the moon? I don't, I don't know. Did you see that study that came out recently that that showed the ambient air temperature of about uh, was it thirteen, fourteen C in lava tubes on the surface of uh, the moon? Well, um, under the surface of the moon. I'm really curious to see if that's if that's true, and if it is, then maybe we run foundries uh, underground, uh, under the lunar surface, and then yeah, I'm that's it's very exciting with uh, microgravity. You know, one sixteenth of our gravity a liftoff is certainly very easy, uh, and we certainly don't have the gravitational forces that are pulling us onto the surface of the moon and causing us to crash into, you know, a fiery ball. So hopefully, uh, you know, landing, uh, 
uh, it, ingress, egress, uh, or EDL. EDL is going to be very easy. It won't be um, as costly an endeavor in terms of the, the amount of fuel that will be needed. I, that's that's exciting. You know that. Um, but but honestly, it's living in 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 living in mass, so that a great number of humans, not just three or two at a time. Um, I think Artemis is hoping for three at a time. But let's let's hope that that we have 30, 40, 50, 100 people living there and living in mass and, and, and thriving, right? That's that's the other thing, right? Will we be able to thrive in that environment? That will give us a very good idea that, you know, Mars isn't going to be as difficult, right? It's uh, the seven minutes of terror that we all hear about Mars landing on the surface of Mars. I am... Uh, I do worry about EDL on Mars all the time. It, it, that's a scary endeavor with humans <laughs> on board a, uh, a lander. So <laughs> I wish we could say that was different, but that may never change, right? It looks like it's going to be a, <laughs> a scary endeavor no matter what. So, but yeah, there you are. Let's, let's use that as the test bed. Let's get there as fast as we can. I, I, I'm nearing 60 years old. So, you know, let's let's do it sooner the better. I'd like to see all this happen by the time I'm mid 80s. And so we have 25 years. Let's go. Let's just get there as fast as we can. That's going to happen. So the APUS analog research group uh, recently completed the two analog missions and you were the mission commander for the same. Tell, her, tell us more about the mission and your experience. Yeah, um, well, I was um, I was mission commander for the second, the second, uh, we called it ARG-2, um, ARG-2, and that, that was a great experience. Uh, in the, in the first ARG mission, which was 11 days, um, it's a very realistic, high fidelity analog environment. Um, you, you're, uh, you're required to don and doff uh, spacesuits. Um, I don't know if you've seen many of the video, but you're uh, you're not allowed to just walk around freely outside of the uh, of the habitat. It's very realistic. It's um, the inflatable part, which is the core command module, um, is is inflated to a little a little less than one atmosphere. You don't feel it. It's just that uh, you know that there's there's a constant pressure, uh, and, and that is a great that's a great way to test our mechanics, right? And to test our engineering, just to know that we can continue on and and um, and you know, provide those uh, <clears throat> you know those atmospheres that we can protect our 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 astronauts, our astronaut core. Yeah, the um, the second mission where I was the the commander. So first mission, I was a uh, uh, chief science officer. I was CSO, and I, I worked um, in the plant module every day. And I was uh, I was propagating algae, and I think microalgae, particularly um, Arthrospira platensis, a platensis, which is a very thin walled algae, is a really useful algae to to invigorate uh, really bad soils you know you and i both know there's bad soils everywhere at all latitudes so we, we've got that challenge ahead of us you know how do we invigorate our soils without using petrochemicals particularly uh, because we know acidification is a horrible absolute detrimental thing to our ocean waterways and our oceans um you know we, we clearly can see that now unfortunately and I, I, I really hope that, you know, the goal would be that what we learn in these analog environments, we can translate to and move out to the real world. Uh, I, I do believe that the research that I'm, I'm one of the research projects that we're on, there's a group of us uh, sponsored. We've got uh, corporate sponsors. We have corporate money as well. And, um, you know, I, I'm convinced that with the, you know, kind of making a, a cocktail, so to speak, of um, of a um, of a carbon-based 
soil of some kind and mixed with uh, a platensis and maybe even a live strain of a platensis because it's a break it breaks down really quickly and because it breaks down so quickly you know the nutrients release as well quickly and i think that's uh so speed and and efficacy are two things that we really want to work hand in hand i, I wouldn't want to hopefully invigorate new or bad soil and take generations right i'd like for i'd like for that to happen in weeks and i think that uh we can do that with um with aplotensis and uh, biochar biochar is kind of a byproduct of what we're hoping we can get through um, uh, remediation of uh, carbon dioxide out of our air and I, I i believe that it might work we're um we're hoping to we're hoping to work through that here real soon. That's probably on the horizon for us. I'd say in the next year, that's the goal. Yeah, analogs are a brilliant place. The second mission was oh, the second mission was fourteen days. You know, it, it, people are funny. Humans, humans are are funny in those environments, right? You're locked in. Uh, you're only out for at the most an hour and change in your spacesuit. And it's a real, this is a high fidelity spacesuit. It is a, an actual spacesuit that's pressured up to only one atmosphere. And um, it has all the weight and has the features of, of a spacesuit. It has the communication systems that you would have in a spacesuit. Um, the gloves and the, you know, the dexterity are, are really high fidelity. And so you, you really can only have that on for the better part of an hour or two in the heat. It's also quite hot um, in North Dakota. Uh, during the day, and so that 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 take it that takes its toll, right? And then after uh, it's so funny, and I know you know this. So and, and about it's called the third quarter syndrome. I'm sure you've heard of it. And people start they start getting a bit stir crazy, and even me, even me, on almost identically on the it was the tenth, eleventh uh, day. I was like, wow, I could you know I could move out of this place right now and be happy. Uh, but funny enough. Uh, you know, one of the other participants on the mission on the 10th day was like, hey, this is getting really old. <laughs> There's nothing we could do. We're stuck for another four days. Stick it out. Come on. One, um, so the mission operation, uh, so we have mission operations or command that are, we, I report into every day, right? And so we had that delay. And so we mimicked the delay uh, for 10 minutes. So I sent the note 10 minutes later. I get the response, well, 20 minutes later. You tell that sailor he's a military guy. You tell that sailor to lean into the wind. And I laughed, and so I had to tell that sailor to lean into the wind. But um, it was very funny. Yeah, it happens. It's a real thing where people get stir crazy. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take music, entertainment. It's going to take um, art. There are, there are a lot of things we're going to have to include in order to keep people sane. And the I call them tin cans because it feels like it's a tin can that you're just tied into and you can't get out. And uh, so, yeah, we're gonna need, it's gonna have to be all of that, right? Books, movies. We watched, um, uh, we downloaded movies and we watched movies at night. And, and I read a bunch. I read the Freeman Dyson book for the second time. And, you know, that's, um, yeah, definitely a lot of work to stay sane in those environments, but, it's brilliant. Uh, the science is spectacular. The science you get out of those environments is uh, you, you cannot replicate that science here in the laboratory. It's uh, it's different uh, and it's uh, it's high fidelity. It's also uh, because you're not distracted. So the distractions of our real world here are there are numerous. Right. Uh, for me, it's the children and the family and the business. You know, there are none of that there. And you really are able to, to you're your work rate, it, it probably doubles in terms of your work rate and your ability to, to create really good science. That is the one benefit that um, not a lot of not a lot of scientists are referring to that when they speak to um, the benefit of an analog. Anyway, I could go on about analogs. Yeah, I, I'm a big believer in it. Okay, uh, we have discussed a lot about books, but still, is there any book uh, which you want to recommend to our listeners out there, and also a movie? Uh, so, Kip Thorne's movie that he helped with, which was uh, Interstellar, 
Interstellar is a very thought provoking movie. Um, that helps me think really big. And I'll, I'll sometimes I, I have that movie on a lot. I have to be honest. Uh, I might even have it on in the background just, you know, as um, um, just to keep me thinking, you know, out and beyond uh, uh, the Van Allen belts. Uh, Gravity was another one that made me realize the Kessler syndrome is a real thing. Um, very disconcerting. Um, clearly, it's a real thing as well. We we see that every day. Uh, we worry about that every day. We hear about satellites practically every week disappearing. Where do they go? You know, and you know. So I, yeah, I, those are the kind of the two sci-fi movies that I, I, I go to regularly uh, it, for me and um, books, you know, I have to go back to, to uh, Hawking's. I have it here. Um, Stephen Hawking's uh, the cosmos explained, right. Um, that was, that was probably where I first cut my teeth in astrophysics. And, uh, and I realized, I, I realized that's what I wanted to do. That was, 22 years ago and you know that's that's so i my first career was in the property business i was a property consultant and i had to continue that on as i was moving into astrophysics uh because i had to pay the bills and um and as i moved out of the property consultancy that i have i still have uh, unfortunately but fortunately you know, and moving into astrophysics, uh, I still go back to that book often and I have it on, um, I listen to it as well. I listen to Audible. So when, I, uh, when I'm in my car or I have my headphones on, I, I, I listen to books all the time. Uh, my, my most recent book is, uh, it's, uh, it's brilliant that I'm listening to. It's, uh, it's off the charts, it's so good. Um, and let me see, here it is. Uh, existential physics existential physics and she's 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 really good i also don't listen to it um maybe like uh, many of us in the audience here i don't listen to it at um at the speed that they that they um that they produce right they produce at one times i listen to it at one and a half times speed because you know you and i can probably process data a lot faster Right. And so if I have to listen to it again, I'll just rewind and listen to it again. But in the, in the meantime, I listen to everything one and a half speed. And, and so I listen, to, I listen to a lot of books. I, I think I've listened to almost um, almost 300 books in the past. Well, since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, what is that? Almost three years now, right? Or two and a half years. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big believer in, in, in listening to books. Now, for books that that I really like right now that that I'm I'm kind of just finished, and and it's uh it's it's Bruce Drain's book and it's the physics of the interstellar uh, interstellar medium and the intergalactic medium, brilliant, uh, and it's it's short. It gives you all the math. I love the math. The math is brilliant. Hey, but you have to remember one thing, right? When we leave the surface of the earth and we move out into the cosmos quote unquote we're bringing all the baggage that we have with us we're bringing it uh, that means we need to learn best about how to to live uh, to love and to understand humans outside of earth and and so loretta whiteside's book which i don't see it here i have it next door um Loretta Whiteside, Loretta Hidalgo, Whiteside Hidalgo, or Hidalgo Whiteside. Her book is really good. If you look her up, she's uh, she's also amazing. Um, and then the last little book that I just just started reading is New Frontiers in Astrobiology that I'm using as a as a as a I'm going to use it as, to teach. So I'm, it's a it's a brilliant book, and it just came out, and it's um. um Pareg uh, Vashapayan, Vasham Payan, and then Rebecca Thombre, and they're the editors on it. And it's a it's a brilliant book to teach um, high school, high school and undergrad. And so I'm I'm teaching that right now. That's a really really good kind of curricular 
textbook if you get a chance. I, I can share all these with you um, later on. I sure do. I'll be waiting for that. And to end with the interview, is there something you want to add or a message you want to give out? yeah yeah this this is i could go on like for hours on this one um i won't uh because time is money and um we can't stop thinking big right we uh find that one or one really amazing question that you feel like needs to be answered and try to answer it whatever that might be don't be so uh, focus that you're not looking at the big picture, right? The big picture is also incredibly important. But to me, I'm, I'm, I, I, I wanted to understand astrophysics, interstellar, and, and I kind of se sequentially did it, right? Astrophysics, understanding all things small, all particles. And once I had perfected that, then I wanted to move on to understanding. Kind of, so it, probably like you, right? I understand that... Um, uh, quantum the quantum realm kind of controls everything but nobody talks about that well a few of us do yeah, the that that transcends to other things right it transcends to the interstellar medium it transcends to protoplanetary disk and then it transcends to the formation of planets in the or the accretion onto the one meter um ball of rock <laughs> how did that rock become earth and you know so that's that's kind of where i i saw it Pick that one little, maybe go all the way to the beginning of what you think might be the beginning and try to answer from there. Uh, progr but progressively always looking to expand your mind and don't stop thinking big. Big means, yeah, let's let's go to Mars. Jupiter's not too far, right? We could get there pretty quick. Uh, let's get to Enceladus. Let's get to Titan, right? Titan is a fascinating subject. Sounds like we're going. Let's go to other places. Um, I, I wish everything propulsion. So someone in the audience hopefully finds the means and the methodologies to get us to move really, really fast and and fast and quick and, and speed of light. Probably not possible, but faster is better. And we need to propulse ourselves quickly from one place to the next. So let's work on that propulsion. Uh, yeah, there are so many things. It, you you and I don't know each other long, but um, I think that I when I first got my degree, it was it was um, in aerospace science, and I, I I particularly was keen on the rocket equation. And the rocket equation, I looked at it and I thought, wow, this thing is primitive. The the rocket equation itself, it's so primitive. We've we need to move faster. So what is that going to take anyway? So there you are. That's my. That's my message to uh, all the dreamers out there. Don't stop. Look for, look for the small and, and solve the big problems. Okay. Thank you, Terry. Thank you very much for being us. It was a great time with you. It was the best uh, I can just end my week with. So that was a beautiful conversation with Mr. Terry Triveno. As always, I'll be putting down his LinkedIn account in description box. You can reach him anytime you want. Also, do let us know what you feel about this video series and particularly about this interview down in comment section. This whole video series is available as a podcast in various podcast channels also. So do go through the description box and follow Astro Capsule on the podcast channel you like you follow thank you so much for being with us see you soon